Good morning. Good morning. Where's RJ? I hope everybody has had a good weekend. If you wear blue and gold, you've had a great day yesterday. If you wear green and white, it wasn't so good. But that's okay. It's just the game. It's just the game. It's not the end of the world yet. So uh, we are excited today. I am really excited about today because today I get to meet with about new small group people. And I am really excited about what God's going to do through small group. Uh, there's a, of the lo seven largest churches in the United States, five of them started with small groups. And we're just getting started with small groups, so we're going, we're going to go. And another pastor says this, small group is the DNA of the church. Because, you know why? Because I get to pour my heart out to brothers and sisters that don't know me. And they get to pour their heart out to me. And we can... We can cry. I do a lot of that. We can do a lot of crying together. We can do a lot of sharing together. Um, and if you weren't in a small group last time, uh, I think we, we've got started in about two weeks, but we're going to announce that later. But I think you, if you want to sign up for a small group, I would say you could still have time to do a small group. And I would advise it because it's a great time. It's a lot of fun. It is. It's a lot of fun. A lot of Bible study. And uh, it's not all food, but it's a lot of fun. We have a lot of fun in small group, and we learn a lot, and we learn a lot about each other. So if you haven't signed up for a small group, I think you still have time maybe to do that. If not, I know somebody that can get you in. Okay. Let's sing Heavenly Sunlight. We've got the sun shining this morning, so let's sing Heavenly Sunlight. Walking in sunlight all of my journey Over the mountains, through the deep vale Jesus has said, I'll never forsake thee Promise divine that never can fail Heavenly sunlight, heavenly sunlight Flooding my soul with glory divine that we're receiving for the Ola Cox uh, offering that goes to our West Virginia missions. 
Um, today we're supposed to be praying for a church in Berkeley Springs, West Virginia, Wellspring Church. Um, and the pastor's name there is Ricky Love. So we're going to remember them in our prayer today. Also, if you're paying attention to this, you would have seen that there's something called Summit Student Camp, which is in the summer for teenagers. Huh, Mackenzie? Ah, yeah. So um, here's great things that we need to be praying for because all our mission uh, money that we take <clears throat> goes into West Virginia missions to uh, do camps, to do uh, church plants, um, and to, to start new church plants. So um, let's, let's remember these people in prayer, okay? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the opportunity to give above and beyond our tithes. Uh, thank you for blessing us. God, we are a blessed people beyond measure. And uh, Father, I know that in hard times it's easy not to give, but Lord, you tell us to be cheerful when we give. And so Father, I pray that you will take the offering that we've given um, and that you will bless it and use it to further the gospel in this great state of West Virginia. That you would bless the church at the uh, um, Wellspring Church up in Berkeley Springs and the camps that go on during the summer, uh, Father, and, and the other church plants. Uh, Father, I pray that you would bless them, encourage them, and Father, I pray that you might uh, just use them for your glory as they reach out to people. Father, I thank you for loving us, and I thank you for your grace and mercy. And Father, we just give you the praise for what you're going to do. Now, Lord, speak to hearts today as we minister um, and as we look into your word and as we sing praises uh, Father, may they be songs filled with uh, love and hope and joy. Uh, and Father, may you be glorified and lifted on high because you alone are the only one worthy to receive our glory. And Father, we thank you for that. In Jesus' name and all God's people said, amen. amen. All right, you, if you did not bring an offering, you can still put it in. We'll, we'll hold off and send that probably at the end of the month. So just in case you want to give more.
Good morning. Turn to 1 Peter chapter 1. 1 Peter chapter 1. In the 1600s, uh, early 1600s, one of the um, most powerful entities going on, um, and there were really two that were in, in power against each other, was the Church of England and the Catholic Church. And the Catholic Church began to infiltrate the Church of England. England. And so in 1620, somewhere around there, there was a group called the Puritans who came out of the Church of England because they wanted to get back to the church that Jesus created, told us to make, instead of what was being created in the Church of England. And if you know your history, the Church of England went from winning souls to now where it is now today, where it's just like the Catholic Church. It's dead. Um, the Puritans were a group of people who basically were living for religious freedom, uh, much as we try to live today. Um, and they wanted to live and worship God the way they wanted to worship. One of the guys' name was Thomas Watson. Thomas Watson said this about the redemption of God's greatest work. And, and you can write this down, but it's not going to be up there very long, so I suggest you just take a picture of it or just memorize it. Um, but he said this, Great was the work of creation. Amen? It was great. But greater the work of redemption. It cost more to redeem us than to make us. In the one, there was but the speaking of the word. In the other, the shedding of blood. The creation was but the work of God's fingers. Redemption is the work of his arm. Isn't that great? Amen? We're going to talk about the wonder of redemption today, so stand with me as we read from Peter's writing in 1 Peter chapter 1. We're going to start verse 13, and we're going to go through the end of the chapter. Uh, actually, we're going to go through verse 3 of chapter 2. I'll read the odd. You read the very good. Therefore, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, and rest your hope fully upon the grace that is to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. But as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. And if you call on the Father, who with partiality judges according to each man's work, without, I'm sorry, let me go back, who without partiality judges according to each man's work, 
conduct yourselves throughout the time of your stay here in fear. But with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. who through him believe in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory so that your faith and hope are in God. Having been born again, not of corruptible seed, but incorruptible through the word of God, which lives and abides forever. Because all flesh is as grass. That's what you just read. But the word of the Lord endures forever. Now this is the word which by the gospel was preached to you. Therefore, laying aside all malice, all deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and all evil speaking. If indeed you have tasted that the Lord is gracious. Let's pray. Father, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you for Jesus. His precious blood, his sacrifice of death that paid the penalty for our sins. That gives us faith and hope for eternal life and for this life. And Father, in him we place our trust because you are good. You are gracious You are loving, you are kind, and in you we find the greatest hope of all, eternal life. And so I pray today that if there's one here who does not have eternal life, that today they'll look inside their own heart and they'll see their need. That today for Christians, that they'll look inside their their hearts and see where where they are not living for you and will turn back to you. Father, thank you for loving us. In Jesus' name, and all God's people said... Amen. All right, so we are talking about redemption. Redemption is a term that describes one of the essential features of salvation. It deals specifically with the cost of salvation and the means by which God received payment because everyone is helpless. We are helpless slaves to sin. Radford was born condemned to die. That's sad, isn't it? You think, no, no, no. Yes, he was, just like you and just like I. We were condemned. We are condemned by the law because you know what? One of these days, I hate to tell him this, but Radford's going to do something that they tell him not to do. It just happens. It just happens. We're condemned by the law. And if we're to be forgiven and reconciled to God, then we need him to purchase us back from that condition. Redeemed in the passage that we're going to look at today is the key word. And the Greek word is lutro. Lutro. Say that. It's fun to say. Lutro. I don't know why it's fun to say. I just think it's fun to say. Lutro. It means to purchase, release by paying a ransom or to deliver by the payment of a price. To the Greeks, the word was a technical term for when they would go and they would pay to get their prisoners of war, their soldiers who had been captured, they would pay their enemy a price, and their enemies would give their soldiers back. Peter's not referring to prisoners of war. Or is he? Because we really technically are in a war. And too many people are still prisoners. Prisoners. 
to their sin. And so, where does he get this? Well, go back to Exodus chapter 12. Exodus chapter 12. Redemption is derived from this Old Testament passage, very familiar passage that we have uh, looked looked at in the past. We've studied it. It's about the Passover. Um, In verse 1, he says, The Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, saying, This month shall be your beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year to you. Speak to all the congregation of Israel, saying, On the tenth of this month, every man shall take for himself a lamb, according to the house of his father, a lamb for a household. And if the household is too small for the lamb, let him and his neighbor next to his door, uh, next to his house, take it according to the number of the persons. According to each man's need, you shall make your count for the lamb. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male of the first year. You may take it from the sheep or from the goats. Now, you shall keep it until the 14th day of the same month. Then the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it at twilight which is between the evenings, is what twilight means. Then, sh- then they shall take some of the blood and put it on the two doorposts and on the lintel of the houses where they eat it. Uh, then they shall eat the flesh on that night, roasted in fire with unleavened bread and with bitter herbs, they shall eat it. Do not eat it raw, nor boiled at all with water, but roasted in fire, its head with its legs and its entrails. You shall, not, you shall let none of it remain until morning, And what remains of it until morning you shall burn with fire. And thus you shall eat it with a belt on your waist, your sandals on your feet, your staff in your hand. So you shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's, what? Passover. It's the Lord's Passover. For I will will pass through the land of Egypt on that night, will strike all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and against all the gods of Egypt I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. Now the blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. And the plague shall not be on you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. The lamb's price, the lamb's life became the price. Which was required to spare the life of the firstborn in those households. Those Israelites' household, the lamb was this divinely ordained illustration. It was a sacrifice that was showing you uh, the sacrificial death of an innocent substitute that redeemed those in bondage. This Passover event immediately became their symbol of substitutionary redemption. Every year from then on, They would go on the 10th day of the month and take a lamb and then take it out. Take a lamb and take it out until the 14th day. Then they would take it and they would have that lamb slaughtered as a symbol that they were paying, having paid, this lamb was paying for their sins. Did that lamb live or die? It died. God decreed that this celebration, this Passover, was to continue from that day on. And it did. And it did. Um, Every day. And the purpose of that event was to do nothing more than to point them to Jesus, who would one day come and become the Lamb of God, who would sacrifice His own life for their sins, not, not every year, but forever. And that true lamb would one day do that. He would become their substitutionary sacrifice. And so we've been talking about in our, in our study here, the suffering Christians should remember their great salvation. We've looked at that. We've had expectant hope, a living hope in Jesus Christ. We have a triumphant entrance into glory. We, we understand that. But the Israelites now are, are, who remembered that Passover is God's greatest display of redeeming power. They went in those homes that night, put the blood on their doorpost, and the death angel passed over them 
and spared their lives. And the next day they were set free. And so they remembered that and they celebrated that every year. And as great as that redemption was, the one that Peter is referring to surpasses that. As if to reemphasize the greatness of God's salvation, this passage we're going to look at today is going to provide believers with a theology. It's going to provide us with a theology of redemption. Being bought again. And, the re- and how it does it is it asks four crucial questions that we need to look at. What did God redeem believers from? What did he redeem them with? By whom did he redeem them? And for what did he redeem them? All right, those are the four questions. We'll get to each one. Uh, What did God redeem believers from? Let's look again at Scripture. Look back at verse 14. I hope you brought your Bibles because it's easier to follow than have Charlie go because he flips from there, from that screen, to Scripture. And I see some of you go, at Charlie. Don't go, at Charlie. He's trying to keep up with me. Just leave that up there and don't put Scripture up there. If they don't bring their Bibles, that's on them, not on you, brother. Bring your Bibles to church. Remember those commercials, don't leave home without it? That that goes for the Word of God. Don't leave home without it. Look, go go back to 13. Therefore, gird up the loins of your mind. Be sober, rest your hope fully upon the grace that is to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, not conforming yourselves to the former lust, as in your ignorance. But as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Because it is written, be holy, for I am holy. And if you call on the Father, isn't it great to know that you can call on God as your Father? Wow, what a wonderful relationship. And that He will listen to you without partiality. He judges us without partiality according to our works. Conduct ourselves throughout the time you stay here in fear, knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold from your aimless conduct received by tradition from your fathers. So the first thing we have to ask, we ask is, what did God redeem believers from? And we're, we were all once held in bondage. We were all slaves to sin. Whether you, you think about it or not, you say, well, I was saved when I was five. You were still a sinner, right? You were still a sinner, and you were in bondage to that, sla- to that sin and the wrath. And, and there's only one way to break that, and that's through the blood of Jesus Christ, through Jesus Christ. And it is only by the abundant grace of God that I can even come and sing amazing grace. My chains are gone. So Peter sets before us in this passage four features that characterize everyone, including the redeemed. Every one of us have had these problems. Every single one. The first one is, he talks about in verse 14, former lust. In verse 14, as obedient children, not concern, concerning, conforming yourselves to the former lust. The word lust is our compelling, driving passions, usually for what is evil. Compelling, driving passions, usually for what is evil. The term that goes along with that is imagination. Um, often in, in uh, older Christian literature, they, you'll see that word imagination thrown in for the word uh, uh, lust. Um, in fact, in the King James Version of, of, of uh, the Bible, in Genesis chapter 6, verse 5, it's describing the situation that's in the world before the flood. And this is what it says. Um, And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every imagination of the thoughts, every desire, every passion, every thought uh, of his heart was only evil continually. Does that sound like today? Does that sound like where... The world is calling good evil and evil good. Yeah, amen? Sad, isn't it? The flesh, okay, the flesh controls the imagination of those who are not saved. And if it's not kept in check, it can also affect the believer's imagination. I want you to catch that. If you are not keeping your thoughts under control... It can control you. Evil thoughts can control you. Even though you're a believer. 
and, and it can control unbelievers and believers, so much so that girls will think that they're boys, and boys can believe they can become girls, and they can believe that they're dogs or they're cats. You with me? We have people who think this way today. I... Heather talked about it. You know, if you think you're a rabbit, it's rabbit season right now. You better be careful, right? I mean, if you think that way, Bible says, professing themselves to be wise, they have become fools. And that's what's happening in our world today. We see it all over the place. And what We call it a different word. We call it insanity. Right, and that's what uh, that verse professing themselves to be wise, they become, they become fools. Really means they, they they're insane. Um, why is that? Because they have allowed their sinful imagination to control truth. And they believe what they want to believe instead of what God has made them. That's right. You tell us, buddy. Um, that sinful imagination will basically become nothing more than lies and distortions about themselves. Personal relationships, personal fulfillment, the general nature of things, and about God. They become God in their own eyes. And those false perceptions lead people to all sorts of sinful behavior. And so that's why in verse 13 he tells you, Gird up the loins of your mind. In other words, guard your mind, folks. Guard your mind. And the best way to guard your mind is to be in the Word of God. Be in the Word of God. If you're coming here on Sunday morning and you have not opened your Bible all week long, you're getting fed a meal. And you're like someone who's starving to death. And you're getting food and you're becoming sick on it. It's not helping you. It's only hurting you. And so what you need to do is spend time every single day in the Word of God. And when you spend time every day in the Word of God, and then you come on Sunday morning and you hear a message preached by Fred or myself or somebody else, then you say, oh, that's fulfilling. That's good. I need that for this week. And then you go out and start again. It's important to be in the Word of God. Second second thing is, Um, ignorance, he says in verse 14, as obedient children, not conforming yourselves to the former lust as in your ignorance. That refers to an absence of spiritual understanding. An absence of spiritual understanding. Did I PowerPoint John 8, 43? Did I put that on there? No? Man, now I got to look it up in my Bible. No, don't put it on the screen. <laughs> Thank you. John 8, 43. John 8, 43. All right, the Jewish leader's spiritual ignorance. Exactly. Prompted Jesus to rebuke them, and he said this, John 8, 43. Why do you not understand my speech? Because you're not able to listen to my word. Why? Because you are of your father, the devil. And the desires of your father you want to do. He's a murderer from the beginning. He does not stand in the truth because there's no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resources. For he's a liar and the father of it. Why don't people understand spiritual truth? Because they're of their father, the devil. And they're not going to understand it unless you're praying that God will open their eyes to truth. Paul said that he, he was a blasphemer, a blasphemer, a liar, a persecutor, and a violent aggressor, and that he acted ignorantly in unbelief. And so did we. We acted that way before we came to know Christ. But we have been redeemed from that ignorance. We now can understand because we have the Holy Spirit indwelling within us. And so when we come to God's word and you say, I don't understand it, he does. So you pray, let the Holy Spirit help me understand the words that I'm about to read. And he helps you. Number three, the futile way of life. 
Verse 18, he goes on to say, knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold from your aimless conduct. He says, that way of living is vain. It's worthless. All the amount of money in the world cannot save your soul. You can be the richest person in, in the world, and if you don't know Jesus Christ, you're dying and going to hell. You can own all of the land in America, and if you don't know Jesus Christ, you're dying and going to hell. And all of that stuff that we have, you know, <clears throat> all of the stuff that you hoard, all right, now I'm meddling, all of that stuff you're holding on to, I hate to tell you all this, but when you die, it ain't going with you. People that don't have as much, sometimes, most of the time, are happier than the people that have so much. Living for things on this earth is futile. It's all passing away. It's just temporary. Jesus said, what shall it profit a man to gain the whole world and yet lose his soul? Listen, we are so focused on comforts. We need to be more focused on the people who are dying and going to hell. Amen? Number four, religious tradition. Look at the end of verse 18. Knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold from your aimless conduct received by tradition from your fathers. The Pharisees, all of the followers, all of their followers, these people were prime examples of what worthless tradition was. In fact, Jesus called them vipers. John, ba John the Baptist called them vipers. Jesus said to him, he said, You hypocrites, rightly did Isaiah prophesy of you. This people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. But in vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the precepts of men. <clears throat> In the movie last night, the little boy came up to uh, the girl's father, who was a Muslim, and said, are you religious? And he said, yes, I am. Which was a true statement. But what good did that religion do him? None. It's only till we surrender our heart and everything that we have to the Lordship of Jesus Christ do we receive joy and understanding of who he truly is. Number two, question, what did God redeem believers with? Again, go back to verse 18. Knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold from your aimless conduct received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. So we'll start with the first word, <clears throat> knowing. What do you know? You know that Jesus died for you. You know that you cannot buy salvation. You know that. You know that you were not redeemed with parable, perishable things, right? That was weak. Do you know that? I mean, it's the grace of God. Redemption price was not some valuable earthly commodity like silver and gold. And I think what Peter has in mind here is a passage in Exodus chapter 30, verse 13 through 15, where it talks about how the, the, the people of Israel... Um, people of Israel, they did a census on uh, the, the men that were able to fight. And God came down and said, why are you doing that? And they said, well, we want to know who, who, that we, who, who's going to protect us. And God was basically telling them, I'm going to protect you. You need to trust me. And because you don't trust me, every single man has to bring half a shekel to the, to the temple and give it, give it to me. And I think that's where Peter's getting this idea from. Uh, the taking of a census was a sin because they weren't trusting God. They were trusting themselves. 
Um, and Peter knew that unlike those temporal redemption that, with money that God permitted the Israelites to purchase in Exodus 30, that no amount of money can redeem somebody's soul. And so having stated what believers were not redeemed with, Peter goes on and says, You were redeemed with the precious blood of Jesus. He used blood as a vivid synonym for sacrificial death. His death involved the shedding of blood. The blood was not just any blood. It was precious. Why? Because it belonged to Jesus, who was perfect. He was unblemished. He was spotless. That's exactly what God required the Israelites to bring to him. Peter's words give us this perfect picture of an immense sacrifice that the owner of a lamb made when he killed his flock's finest, purest, perfect animal. No other sacrificial animal or any other animal sacrifice could ever take away sin. Those sacrifices are showed the deadly effects of sin and pictured the idea of an ultimate substitute. Taking the sinner's place fulfilled in the sacrifice of Jesus Christ once and for all. That Jesus was absolutely, perfectly, spotless, unblemished, is a perfect testimony of Scripture, especially concerning the doctrine that we call imputation. And I want you to turn to, and I may have put that one up there, uh, 2 Corinthians 5.21. I did put that one up there. <clears throat> you can turn there anyway because you want to highlight it, circle it. Mark in your Bibles so you know where you are. Look, he said, For he made him, this is Paul, <clears throat> talking about Jesus and God. He said he, meaning God, made him, Jesus, who knew no sin, to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. That's the verse. Now let's go to the next slide, and then we'll come back to that verse. Imputation speaks of a legal reckoning. To impute guilt to someone is to assign guilt to a person's account. Peter's referring to this word and talking about this because he's un these people understand. Nero had set fire to his own town, Rome. And when they started pointing the finger at him, what did, he, what did Nero do? He blamed it on the Christians. He blamed it on the Christians. Hitler wanted to tell the people in Germany that they lost the world war, First World War, and it was because of the Jews. It wasn't because of the Jews. But he wanted to get the blame on somebody else. He was imputing this, the, the imperfection of his country onto a group of people. You with me? That's what Nero did. That's what Hitler did. That's what your president did. He's done that since day one. Everything has been Trump's fault. Everything has been Putin's fault. And now everything is everybody's fault who didn't vote for him. Truth? Is there any difference? I don't see any difference. To impute righteousness means that I need to reckon that that person is righteous. A person to whom guilt is imputed is not thereby actually made guilty in the real sense, but he's accounted as guilty in a legal sense. In other words, it is reckoning, not an actual remaking of a person's character. The guilt of all mankind, every single sinner, was imputed on Jesus Christ. 
He was not in any sense tainted with guilt. He was merely reckoned as being guilty before the court of heaven. And the penalty of all that guilt was execution. Sin was imputed on him. It was not imparted on him. And that's a remarkable statement. When you go back to that verse, God made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf. It cannot mean that Christ became a sinner. It cannot mean that Jesus committed any sin and that his character was defiled or that he bore our sin in any sense other than, excuse me, by legal imputation. Why? Because Christ had no capacity to sin. He knew no sin. He was spotless. He had to be. He had to be. To be our perfect substitute, he had to be holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners. He, if he had become an actual sinner, he would have then been, he would have then been worthy of sin's penalty himself. He would have been unqualified to pay for our sin. The perfect Lamb of God could not be anything other than spotless. God made him to be sin cannot mean that he was tainted with actual sin. What it means is simply that the guilt from our sin was imputed, was reckoned to Christ, reckoned to his account. He bore our sins. God treated his own son, Jesus, as if he were the greatest sinner who ever lived. And the guilt he bore was not his guilt, but he bore it as if it was his own. God put our guilt to Jesus' account, and he paid the penalty for us. Since all sin then is a violation of God's law and the debt incurred to him, he is the one to whom the price must be paid. Only the creditor God can determine the ransom or the redemption. The price did not have to be paid to Satan. Satan has not been offended by our sin. Right? Right? Adam and Eve, when they sinned, they didn't offend Satan. They offended the Creator. When you and I sin, we don't, we don't offend Satan. We offend the Creator. Um, creator God. And, and that's, uh, that's something that people are teaching now, that we, are, we need to pay this to Satan. No, we don't. We don't owe him anything. Maybe a punch in the face. <laughs> Because all sin is against God. The blood of Christ. Then go back to 1 Peter. He says, the blood of Christ then is defined as the most precious blood of all. Because why? He is the only utterly perfect person who ever lived. The blood of Christ refers not to, the, not to just the fluid in his body, but it, it refers to the whole redemptive act. Scripture speaks of Christ's blood nearly three times as often as it mentions the cross. Five times more often than it refers to the death of Jesus. The, blood, the word blood is the chief term in the New Testament that is used to refer to the atonement, the price that he paid for us. Hebrews 9.22 says, Without the shedding of blood, there can be no remission of sins. If Christ had not literally shed his blood in sacrifice for believers' sin, they could not have been saved. Uh, and that, that's one of the reasons crucifixion was the, the means that God ordained. It was a vivid, uh, visible display being poured out as the price for sins. Bloodshed was God's design. 
Nearly all of the Old Testament talks about these blood sacrifices, these animals that were strangled and clubbed and, and, and suffocated or burnt to death. And God designed that system. And the purpose was to, that the blood would be lost. And he, in Leviticus 17, he says, the life of the flesh is the blood. The literal blood of Jesus was violently shed at the crucifixion. Those who deny that truth or try to spiritualize the death of Jesus are guilty of corrupting the gospel message. There's so many movies out there that show the crucifixion of Jesus, and he's up on the cross with a little blood coming from his hands and from his feet and from his face because of the head because of the crown of thorns, and you're like, ah, oh, that's nothing like the true picture. And I don't even think Mel Gibson's picture, how violent it is, is perfectly describes what Jesus went through for us. Jesus bled and died. And when he rose from the, from the dead, he was literally, bodily resurrected. The meaning of the crucifixion is not fully expressed in that thought of bleeding alone. There was nothing supernatural in Jesus' blood that sanctified those who touched it. You think about that. If Jesus' blood was this supernatural blood... When it was spilt, when he was whipped, all of those people that were around him would have had blood splattered all over him. Did they automatically become clean and perfect and stop beating him and say, oh, I'm done, no, I can't do this? No. No. If blood could redeem sinners, why did Jesus not just bleed, give some blood, every month go to the blood bank there had to be a shedding of blood that's what scripture tells us Romans 5 9 and 10 Romans 5 9 and 10 turn there real quick <clears throat> Romans 5 Paul says in verse 9 much more than having now been justified by his blood we shall be saved from wrath through him. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by what? His life. We're saved. Not just by his blood, his death. We're saved also because he rose again. He's alive. The critical element, the sacrificial death of Christ on sinner's behalf the shedding of his blood was the visible manifestation of his life being poured out in sacrifice. So the blood of Christ is precious. We just sang about it. But as precious as it is, that physical blood alone could not and did not save. Only when it was poured out in death could the penalty of sin be paid. So question number three is, by whom did God redeem believers? Well, let's go back to 1 Peter. In 1 Peter chapter 1, Verse 20, he says, He indeed was foreordained before the foundation of the wor world, but was manifest in these last times for you, who through him believe in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory, so that your faith and hope are in God. By whom did God redeem believers? Peter describes this precious lamb as being unique. Okay? He's going to give us four aspects of this precious lamb. First and foremost, he was predetermined. In other words, he was foreknown. He was foreknown. Literally, it means this, he having been foreknown clearly indicates God planned to send his son as the incarnate redeemer to come down here and redeem us from our sin. God sent him before the foundation of the world. God knew it. You know, God wasn't sitting up there watching Adam and Eve, and when Satan came down to him in the form of the snake and hissed up to oh, oh, Eve and told her, hey, you, you can eat of this apple. God's hiding things from you. It wasn't an apple. We don't know what kind of fruit it was. You can eat of this fruit. And she took that fruit, and then she, she gave it to, to Adam, and Adam ate, and then they went and hid. And God came down and said, oh, Adam, where are you? Adam, 
God didn't need to know where, where Adam was. He already knew where he was. He's like, let's play hide and seek with God. No! Don't do it. Jonah found that out. It doesn't work. Adam and Eve, God was not like, oh, man. Look, guys, they blew it. We made them in this perfect place, and, man, now what are we going to do now and come up with this plan then? He knew before it even happened. He knew. So many times we say to our children, what have you done? And they're like, la, 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 la. And you have to dig to find out the truth. God, God knows. The second reason that Je- this Jesus, is, this precious lamb is unique is because of his, his birth, his incarnation. The verb rendered, uh, re- the verb rendered has appeared, contains the idea of making something clear or manifest. In other words, uh, the f- God became flesh and dwelt among us. That's what he's referring to. That is an historical event. The son became human. Um, the phrase, in these last time, is referring to that entire period between the birth of Jesus and when he comes again the second time. The Greek for times refers to a chronological point in God's calendar of events. So during that time, this time, he's come for us for this period. The third feature of the son's uniqueness in, this, in these verses is his resurrection. God raised him from the dead, an unmistakably powerful proof that he was a sacrifice for sin and that he had accomplished God's redemptive work. And then the fourth thing that Peter reminds believers that Christ is unique is because in ultimate culminating affirmation, God gave Jesus glory. God doesn't give everybody his glory gives it to Jesus. And that phrase points to his ascension. When Jesus went back to heaven, presented himself as the spotless Lamb of God. And God accepted that wrath. God accepted that payment for his wrath for sin and said, here's your seat. Sit down beside me. And that's where he is now. So number four, for what did God redeem believers? What did God believe believers? Look at verse 20. He indeed was foreordained before the foundation of the world but was manifest in these last times. Why? What's it say in your Bible? What's the last two words, verse 20? For you. For you? Yeah. Yeah, get this. As if to highlight an already clear truth, Peter tells him again, here's Christ's redemptive work was the, for you, for your sake. Why did Jesus come? For you. For you. Christ died for you. He came for you. He loves you. Does that not get you excited? Are you too busy taking notes? Maybe I'll wait, let you finish, and then I'll start talking about this. Listen, Jesus loved you so much. He died for you. He died for you. That's what Peter says. Verse 20. He was foredained before the foundation of the world. For what purpose? He was manifest in these last times for you. And since redemption is through him alone, there's no other way to God. And that marks the exclusivity of the gospel as the only way of redemption. People cannot be believers in God apart from acknowledging the death, burial, resurrection, and ascension of the Son. You can't. You believe there's a God, but you're not going to heaven just because you believe the God. there's a God. Satan believes there's a God. The demons believe there's a God. People say, oh, God bless you. You sneeze, oh, God bless you. What does that really mean? Do you believe in God? You cannot believe, be a believer 
if you uh, don't believe in the Son. In fact, all, we do not, all who do not believe the gospel cannot know God at all and are subject to eternal damnation. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 6. Paul is writing and he says, Since it is a righteous thing with God to repay with tribulation those who trouble you and to give you who are troubled rest with us when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. These shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. You know, it should bother us that people this morning are splitting hell's gates wide open. When we have the answers to help them. We have the answer. His name is Jesus. And God doesn't tell us to go out and save them. He says, go out and tell them. And we should consider through him may not only may not only indicate the way to saving belief in God, but the power to believe in the gospel. Since redemption through him produces believers of God. Salvation only comes through faith. Saving faith includes belief in the one true living God and belief through his son, Jesus Christ. Believers in God. And that phrase that Peter talks about, who, uh, verse 21, who through him believe in God. That's implicit. That We have to understand it's not just believing that there is a God, but believing in the God who loved me so much that he sent me a sacrifice, his son, to pay for my sin. And through him, I can have eternal life. The end of verse 21 is really important for us. And there's a twofold blessing about redemption in there. He says in verse 21, who through him believe in God, who raised him from the dead, gave him glory, that last phrase, so that your faith and your hope are in the government. Oh, I'm sorry, I misread that, didn't I? Your faith and hope are in God. No one else, nothing else, just that. Faith enables us, us as believers to trust God. 1,256 boxes. Faith says He can do it. Doubt says there's no way. Faith says I believe and I'm trusting you. 1,256 boxes. Those of you who missed last Sunday, you're missing out. You need to catch up. We're, we are taking the challenge of 1,256 Christmas boxes this year. Don't faint. Just get on board. The, tra the train's rolling down the tracks. Don't miss out. Get on board. Look, the psalm says this. Psalm has said this. Psalm 49, 15. God will redeem my soul from the power of Sheol, of hell, for he will receive me. Believers, today, we need to have an unshakable faith. We need to have an unshakable hope. The God who created this world is still on the throne. He's coming back, and he's taking me home. And I don't know if you want to get on board that or not, but I would encourage you, if you're not on board that train, to get on it. It's a one-way ticket. We say it's a one-way ticket, but we're coming back. We're coming back with him seven years later. We'll be hooping and hollering behind him going, Go, Jesus. Go, Jesus. Go, Jesus. Better calm down. I might have a heart attack up here and go now. Paul said he reminded the Romans, Believers, hope includes 
the redemption of the body. I don't know about you, but I am so thankful that when I get to heaven, this old ragged body won't be the one I'm walking around in. Faith. Saints presently enjoy the redemption of the soul. By hope, saints anticipate the redemption of the body from all remaining effects of the fall. And God redeemed believers so that your faith, your hope, might be in God and nothing else. On that night of the Passover, I'm sure the one person that was sweating the most was the oldest son. Dad, did you put that on there the right way? Papa, are you you sure you put enough blood on there? Sure, would you go out and check? Papa, are are you sure we're we're saying this the way we're supposed to say? Papa, are you sure we're doing this the right way? Papa, are you sure God had spoken? He was going to pass over every house. I had the blood token on the door. If there was a house where the householder had neglected to apply the blood, there was no security. There was no salvation. If the person was trusting in that he was a good person or that he was a religious person or that he had money, it wasn't good enough. And do you know the person that put that blood on that, that post thinking, I don't know how this is going to work. My faith is not strong. My faith is weak. Do you know when that, that death, the angel came, he passed over that person's house too even though their faith was weak because they've been obedient. How about us? Have we been obedient to God? Paul declared your faith and hope should be in God. Too many believers put their faith in faith and they doubt and they despair and they worry and they have anxiety Peter had been through his own personal Gethsemane of doubt and despair He had yet to learn in those dark days when he did that, when he denied Christ three times, that Calvary covers it all. And that a risen and ascended Christ was a sure and safe depository for his faith and his hope. So what are you trusting for your salvation? Or better yet, whom? Are you trusting? Let's pray. In fact, why don't you stand with me? Pray. We're going to open the altar up. If God has spoken to your heart, something you need to come and give to the Lord, now's the time to do it. Maybe you don't know Jesus as your Savior. As we sing this song, I'll be standing up front. I'd love to share with you from the God's Word how you can know for sure you're spending eternity with Him in heaven. Father, have your way in our hearts. Thank you, thank you, thank you for the blood, the death, the burial, the resurrection, and the ascension of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. That's what saves. May our faith and our hope be in you. The God who created this world, who gave us his son to willingly pay that sacrifice for our sin on the cross. Thank you for him. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for your mercy and grace. Have your way in our hearts. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Stand together. Let's sing together. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided 
to follow Jesus. No turning back, no turning back. Though none go with me, I still will follow. Though none go with me, I still will follow. Though none go with me, I still will follow. No turning back, no turning back. My cross I'll carry till I see Jesus. My cross I'll carry. Amen. All right. A um, couple announcements somewhere around here. I have a bulletin, and then we're going to go into our small groups. So if you're in a, if you signed up for small groups or didn't sign up for small groups and you're interested, stick around. Um, <clears throat> Priscilla Shire, you want to say anything about that? Yep. Get get here early. Get your spot because there may be others that come and take your spot and you don't want to do that uh april's closet is coming up and she needs help so sign up there's a sign up sheet if you can help uh put clothes up anybody can help put clothes up um men's bible study monday box there's a box of food up here this is what we're going to be giving away and this is what it will look like for people in need. And so this is why we're asking for canned food, for a box of cereal. Um, there's some crackers. It looks like some sort of beans in there, some pasta, peanut butter. Peanut butter. <laughs> uh, and that kind of stuff. So if you see us it, list it in the bulletin, that's what it's going for. And then the second Saturday of every month, Danielle... Nick, back there, will be handing those out to people in the community. So if you want to help, see Danielle, okay? Um, 1,256 boxes. Well, 1,253, because we have three. But that's the challenge, that's the goal, and I think we can do it. Amen? I know we can do it. You Stop. Judy went shopping. She went to Dollar General. She said, how much for those flip-flops? And she told the lady what they were for, and she said, I'll give them to you for a quarter apiece. And then the manager came up and said, I'll give them to you for 15 cents. Or you, you haggled her down. She's like my wife, a little Jewish. She haggled her down to 15 cents a piece. She bought all of them. Wait, it's not over. She went to pay for it, and the lady took out her card and stuck it in and paid for it. She, tell me God's not working. Come on. Amen. Woo. Packing party afterwards. If you're in a small group, stay after Elijah prays. If not, Stay for the packing party downstairs. Stay anyway, right? Staying for both? Bless you, my child. All right, anything? Uh, prayer request. Bill Chapman's in the hospital. He's had like nine strokes in the past six months or something like that, so pray for him. Um, the Canterbury's are dealing with COVID, and Sharon is dealing with COVID. So it's going around. I would say you started, but it wasn't you necessarily. There is a 
You have COVID? <laughs> there is a young lady that's working in our daycare. Her name is Jordan. Her four-month-old is in the hospital with RSV, um, and it's very, very serious. So be in prayer for his name is um, Jameson. And her seven-year-old, eight-year-old daughter broke her wrist. So pray for her. Her name's Jaden. And Sierra's little guy, Levi, who's always running around here like a chicken with his head cut off. Eli, Eli pushed him and broke his leg. No. Oh, no. He just fell and broke his leg. <laughs> so pray for him as well. All right? So a lot, lot to be in prayer for. What's your prayer request? Right. What's his name? Brent. Brent Surgent. Brent Surgent. All right. All right. Dismiss us in prayer.